Uh, again, welcome everybody this morning. Glad to have you out. And thanks uh, for the opportunity to get to preach. I know Russ and Lee both, we are called to preach. We don't have a church, so we need, uh, I need, I won't say we, I need practice. I think Russ, Russ does better. But uh, it's, it's nice to have this opportunity in front of friendly faces. Uh, last week was in front of friendly faces. It was the, the old home church, and uh, I said it's uh, kind of like the music band, if any of you have seen that. The band plays a song, it sounds awful, but they stand up and say, that's my Barney, or that's my boy. <laughs> I have, have grace on one message that you know, I can make all the mistakes on, and, and they'll be forgiven. This morning, we're going to uh, preach about something that's, I don't know if you've ever heard anything preached about or not, maybe you have, Matthew chapter 4, and it's the temptation that Christ faced in the wilderness, and it's Matthew chapter 4, verses 4 through 11. Now read that, and then we'll have a prayer. <clears throat> then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And, when, and then, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on, on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get hence, Satan, or be gone. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaves him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Just let's bow our heads and pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for this morning that you've given, for the opportunity to hear to preach your word. And Father, help us, help me to do it in a way that does not in any way hinder the purpose that you have for your word, that it goes and accomplishes the, the purpose that you have for it today. Thank you for each one of the folks here. I pray uh, that you do with them. Help them to to look beyond the mistakes I make to, to what you're trying to tell them to be able to apply that word to their lives and let it change their hearts that they be more conformed to the image of Christ in whose name I pray, Amen. So in, in this lesson, in this message, I think <coughs> things I've heard from it as a lesson, there was a message before, is what, what should you do in temptation? Because Christ was tempted and he responded by using scripture, and that, that is a good lesson, that's a good message to have. Um, how, how do we respond to temptation? Uh, another thing you could do is what are temptations? Uh, first John, uh, let's see, first John 2 says something about it, but, but this, what it says in first John 2, this this is kind of like what it is. It, it's the description in first John 2 of, of this event or, or what happened in the garden. Or we could say from this that Christ uh, because he has faced all the temptations that we have faced, is able to comfort us as one who has been tempted himself. Um, we could say from like Hebrews 4, where we have a high priest who is touched with all the infirmities that we face and uh, is able to uh, offer up a sacrifice from, from knowledge, knowing that knowing what we have faced, he's able to do that too. But this morning, he's going to go back to, I think, maybe like a, a foundational thing, maybe maybe not so much applicational, but it's going to tell us something about Christ that we need to know, and that is that Christ undid what we messed up. And uh, if you if you have had if you've done anything, you've probably had to come in behind somebody and fix the mistakes that they've made. Um, I was helping my brother-in-law move one time, and or my brother-in-law and sister. And I, I somehow got elected, or maybe I volunteered to drive the, the uh, moving truck. And he lived on a hill, lives on a hill, and the driveway is about as wide as the truck is, with a ditch on one side and a abyss on the other side. And so I'm backing up, 
and, and it starts to spin a little bit, so I try to reconfigure it a little bit, and about two turns, I have it completely stuck. And so someone is tasked with uh, getting that unstuck. It wasn't like in the ditch yet, but it was going to get close. Someone was tasked with getting it out of that situation, relining it, and getting it up where it's supposed to be. So it wasn't just, it would probably been easier if we just said, okay, you drive it and, and put it in there the first time because he wouldn't have had it undo what I did first. And then we hear stories often about people who, where they move whole houses, like they pick them up and move them. Uh, the first time I ever heard of this, I was in Florida, and my sister said, see that empty lot there? The folks came back from vacation and their house was gone. So they got the wrong address, they picked up the house and moved it across town, and you know, the lot was empty. Someone has to undo that. It would have been easier if you got the right house the first time, and then they had to move one house back, and then get the other house beside it to get where it's supposed to be. So, if you're ever on vacation and your house is gone, you get back, they have to go you know, check your neighbors and see if they were going to have their house moved. But that those have to get undone before you can go on to what to do, what you're supposed to do before. And uh, in, the, in this in Matthew, when we start out just in Matthew, we, Matthew is laying, by, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is laying out who Christ is and what He came on earth to do. And it starts out the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Mentioning those two people is important to the narrative that, that Matthew is going to relate to us of who Christ is and what He came to do. The son of David, He is of the kingly line of Judah, he is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is, he is of the household of faith and the household of Israel. Uh, not that Christ needs faith, but our faith is put in Christ, and, and Abraham put his faith in Christ. And so the genealogy, it goes through several people, but it starts out the genealogy of Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So it's important to Matthew that we understand that, that this is the king that was promised to the nation of Israel. This is the, the head of of all who have faith in God. And then it talks about his, his birth. He was born in uh, Bethlehem, uh, the city of David. But then he had to go to see for his life, his family, his father, and had to take him and his mother to, uh, to Egypt because the babies were going to be killed. So not accidentally, Christ ends up in Egypt, just like Israel had ended up in Egypt. So Christ is there too. When Herod dies, uh, he is brought back to Jerusalem or back to Israel, uh, just like uh, Israel had had to leave Egypt and come back to the to the Promised Land. So Matthew is saying, this, you know, here here is in type in type what happened in the Old Testament. This this is being fulfilled. This is what this was going to show you. Uh, I started back here to bring the people out of Egypt and to give them a nation, and now I'm, I'm showing you. I'm bringing the Redeemer out of Egypt to establish a nation. And then the wise men come to visit him. And uh, they, they are looking, actually that was before they went to Egypt. Sorry about that. The wise men come to visit the king of the Jews. So, so Christ is, is the king. They go to Egypt, they come back. And in Matthew, the, fir the very next thing that we hear about is uh, John baptizing Christ. And it's, it's a big deal to the Israelites as they came through the Red Sea. That was called their baptism, where they, they all went through the same experience. And so Christ, having left Egypt and, and come into the Promised Land, the next event we have is him being baptized by John. Again, trying to draw the Jewish reader who'd been reading this into who Christ is and how he is uh, coming through all of the things they have been through. He is baptized by John and... Uh, is again symbolic of coming through the Red Sea. And as soon as he's done with that, we get to chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. Now, the 40 days and 40 nights are significant to what's going on. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Christ has been in the wilderness uh, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So, Matthew is making the point to the, especially the Jewish reader and for us today, that Christ is very much a part of, a very uh, emblematic or specific. He, he, is, he is what all these experiences you have had 
have led up to, and that's that Christ is going to come. And when uh, the devil comes to tempt Christ, the first thing he says is, um, oh, and here's something that's interesting. Not really a big part of the, the message, but it uh, starts out in verse 1. It says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit to the Lordness to be tempted of the devil. One name for the devil. Then, after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and the tempter came. And then we get down farther and we'll say Satan. So for some reason, uh, God saw fit to mention all these names. Uh, not again, again, not a big part of the message, but interesting to me that it's Satan, the tempter, and the devil. When, the, when Satan comes, the tempter comes, he says, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So even though Israel had failed, we, we can live a life of faithful trust in Christ because he has overcome the failure that Israel had in the wilderness. Whenever Israel left the Promised Land, they, or I'm sorry, left Egypt for the Promised Land, that's, that's a big difference there. Whenever Israel left Egypt and goes out into the wilderness, before they, actually before they even get to the wilderness, they get to the Red Sea, and what was the first thing they do when they get away from the Egyptians? They complain. So then God carries them through the Red Sea, the Egyptian army is destroyed, they're on the other side of the Red Sea. They celebrate for a day. And then, what do they do the next day? They complain. You know, first they complain because you brought us out here to kill us. Then they get across the Red Sea, and they say, we're going to die of thirst out here. There's no water. So God gives them water. And then they go a few more days, and they say, we're going to die from hunger. You know, another complaint. And God gives them food. Then they get to Mount Sinai, and God's given them food, and God's given them water, and then God gives them their law, and they're ready to leave Sinai. They, they had some problems there at Sinai. You know, got the golden calves and all that sort of stuff. And they get ready to leave Sinai. And they're going out into the wilderness now on their way to Israel, into the promised land. And they complain. They, there's a pattern there. And on this complaint, God does end up providing, but he also kills them. Because he has showed them so many mighty works. He's brought them through the wilderness. And when they start complaining, they say, we want some meat to eat. He kills them. And then he starts providing the meat. But they, they have seen God's works. They know who God is, and they have still failed. And the things that they are worried about is not, they, they've forgotten all about the oppression that they complained about and they wanted to leave. They've forgotten about the promise that God's given them to take them into the land. And they start focusing on the here, here and now, not trusting God to take them to the place that God said He's going to do. So Christ, who comes in that in that framework, in that type that has been given, is out in the wilderness. And the wilderness is, is like Satan's territory. When they were coming through to the promised land, they had the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was a place where God was going to dwell. And then around the tabernacle, there was a courtyard where the priests were. And then around that, there was the nation of Israel. They were around there by camp. And then outside of that, it was called the region of the dead in the wilderness. Uh, it's a place where if someone had leprosy or whenever they were offering uh, the sacrifice of atonement and they had to go out into the wilderness, it went outside the camp. And that's where, in their minds, where Satan lived. When Miriam uh, started opposing Moses and Moses, uh, or God actually gave Miriam leprosy, they took her out into the wilderness, outside the camp. That is the region where Satan dwelt. Well, Christ walks into the region where Satan dwelt in the wilderness. And when Satan comes to offer him or tell him, if, if you're the Son of God, make these stones bread, Christ says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's quoting Scripture. Is he quoting Matthew? No. Matthew's not been written yet. He's quoting Deuteronomy. I have to look because I don't remember. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And uh, in Deuteronomy, what's happening is they've gone through the wilderness, they spent their 40 years out there, and they're getting ready to go back in again. They're actually getting to go back in for the first time. They've come back up to the border again. And 
Moses is giving them advice, saying, don't be like your, your rebellious family back there uh, that left Egypt. Trust God. And in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3 of Deuteronomy, Moses tells them, And all the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, and that you will remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or no and humbled you, and suffered you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you knew not, neither did the fathers know that he might make you know man. No, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So Israel was supposed to learn about God's providential care. He took them out of Egypt, the place that they were in bondage, he was moving them to the promised land as he had promised to them. And they did not trust him from point A to point B and were, were rebellious the whole time. But now Christ has come uh, in, in fulfilling the type of what we saw in Israel to show them that man does indeed live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and that we are secure in his providential care. Whether we live or die, God is sovereign, God is supreme, and we do not live only by bread, as Israel saw, they just saw what was around them, but we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Christ has uh, undone the failure that Israel has done in not trusting God. Christ has given up everything, uh, all, of, all of His will to the Father, to trust Him to work out the way things ought to be. And so that even though Israel has failed, we do not have to fail in the same way they did. We can trust God's care toward us because Christ has shown us that God is worthy of that and that, and that we can overcome through Him. And it's the, the way that Satan tempts him first, he says, if you are the Son of God. Well, I'm not telling anybody here anything. We know that He is the Son of God. So if he's the Son of God, why does he not go ahead and turn the stones into bread? Because then he would be doing what Satan says, which would mean then that he isn't God, so he can't do it. So he has to, uh, he is confident in his godness that he does not have to prove. A sovereign God does not have to prove to somebody that he's God, and, and Christ does not have to prove that he's the Son of God because he knows he is. And then trying to prove the way Satan would have framed it, that he was the Son of God, he wouldn't have, by doing that, been saying that he wasn't the Son of God. So he did exactly what he had to do. And that was, quote to Satan, what God had said, and that is that it's not all about bread. It's not about food. It's about what God says. And so he is, he is then victorious in the first, first round of temptations with Satan. Satan is not a slacker. He's not stupid. And so he continues with this onslaught. He takes him up into the holy city, to Jerusalem, sets him on the pinnacle of the temple, and says to, you, to him again, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written. See, Satan understood what Christ had done. Christ had said, Hey, Satan, it's written that you shouldn't do this. So Satan comes back and says, Okay, yeah, I can quote the Bible too. And he does a very good job of it. Satan's pretty good about quoting Scripture. Uh, so you better be careful when people are just throwing scripture out there that you are sure what they're saying. And the big thing is context. What is the most, this is off the subject, but it's one of, one of my pet peeves. What is one of the most quoted scriptures from the Bible? 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm, is yes, Lots of times at funerals they will. John 3.16. 3, but all those, I think, pale in comparison to John... I think it's around 9, where it says, uh, Judge not, lest you be judged. No. That is the most quoted scripture. What? Or Matthew. Okay, Matthew. I, I, okay, thank you. It's not written down in front of me, so I slipped a little bit. But most people love that verse, but they don't read it in context. It's given in a bigger context that we won't do this morning, but we'll show you how taking scripture out of context can be almost humorous. 
So Satan says, cast yourself down if you're the son of God, because I know Scripture says he will give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. And Christ says, Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. When Eve was tempted in the garden, is the same types of temptations that Christ faced. It's lust to the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But she failed. And even though she failed through Christ, we do not have to make this same failure. Jesus uh, is reversing not just the, the failures of Israel in the wilderness, but he's reversing the failures of, of man, of Adam and Eve, in the garden. Satan comes, uh, when, when Eve sinned, and we'll, I'm going to flip over to Genesis 3. You guys don't have to, but in Genesis 3, there is some really, there's a really, really key verse there. In Genesis chapter 3, it's where man falls, where the serpent comes, he tempts Eve, she succumbs to the temptation, she gives to Adam, Adam eats and he sins, and then God comes and, and judges them, uh, or pronounces the judgment that they'd already placed upon themselves, and he says, and the Lord said unto the serpent, because they've, they've done the blame game, he came to, to the head, he came to Adam and said, Adam, what have you done? He said, well, the woman that you gave me, you know, she did this. So he goes to her and she says, oh, no, the serpent you created, he did this. And so God goes to the serpent first and, and comes back up the chain from the serpent to man. And God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field, Upon your belly shall you go, and thus shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And this is a key verse. There's going to be battle between the, the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, between, uh, between you and between your seed, and her seed and your seed. And it, this seed from the woman, shall bruise your head. He, he will crush you, and you will bruise his heel. There will, there will be a battle. You will inflict an injury, but... This seed of the woman will destroy you. And this seed of the woman is the, pro the first promise of a redeemer. God has said that I will send someone to redeem you back and he will crush the power of the serpent and will restore man back to God. And then he goes on to say what, what will happen to the woman and what will happen to the male, to the man. But this is the first promise of a redeemer. Satan comes, we'll fast forward now 4,000 or so years, Satan comes to, the, to Christ and says, if you're the Son of God, cast yourself down because He will give His angels charge concerning you and in your ha their hands they shall bear you up lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. So let's go see what Satan was quoting. And that is in Psalms 91. So in Psalms 91, it, this is a psalm of God's care. It says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shall I trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by the day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near to you. For he shall give his angels charge over you, and this is where Satan's quoting, to keep you in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. That's, that's the only two verses that Satan uses, not in the context of God's protective care happening all over. And he stops, and I'm not sure if he stopped because he knew what the next verse was and didn't want to say it, or if uh, 
he, uh, he didn't know what it said, and so it, it served his purpose and he was done. But then, in verse 13, which he didn't quote, it says, You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. So the next verse is a Psalms prophecy of a redeemer who's going to trample the serpent underneath his feet. So in, in using scripture, Satan might sets Christ up just like right to the, the punchline and says, you know, the Lord will take care of you, but he doesn't say, and you will defeat me. That's he doesn't say that part. He didn't want to say that part, but that's where that's where he's quoting from. So all that maybe is just to say use scripture in context because you don't know what you're saying if you just grab bits and pieces. And I'm not sure Satan knew that he was just but setting Christ up to say, yeah, you're the one that's going to destroy me. But he, know, he knows Scripture better than we do. We need to make sure that when he is tempting us, when he's trying us, that we try his words because he is not doing it for our benefit. But Christ is for our benefit. And so as, as man, you know, first as Israel, or second maybe, as Israel failed and Christ redeemed them, man failed in the garden and Christ has... The new Adam has, has brought us back to relationship with him. And so we, we do not have to make the same failures as Adam made, as our, our forefather made, because we have a new Adam, Christ, who has, who has uh, defeated Satan. And he defeats him by saying, again, it's written, Satan used scripture, but Christ used it appropriately, and it is that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So two different temptations, two different times Satan has said, if you're the Son of God, do this. Both times Christ has not done what Satan said, proving that He is the sinless deliverer, the, the Son of God. And the last attack on Christ has to do not with if you're the Son of God, then do this, but uh, if, if you want these kingdoms that I have taken from you through sin. So He says uh, in verse 8, Again, the devil takes him up into a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. If we pause and think for just a little bit, who is Satan? Who is the devil? He is a created being of God, created to worship God, created to be God's messenger, and he rebelled and sinned. The created is telling to the creator, you need to worship me. And he's saying no. And that, that's his response. First is, he, he exhibits his godly authority over Satan and says, Satan, be gone. God can do that because he is the, uh, the creator. He is, he is the sovereign. He is the Lord. And then he follows up with the, the response, uh, you should worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve, and Satan leaves. Christ, and this, this chapter, this narrative of Christ's temptation is, a, is really, it's big. We mentioned some things we could talk about that we did this morning, but there's scripture, and I don't know if I wrote this reference down or not. Trust me, go get your concordance or pull up your electronic Bible and look at it. It says God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anybody else. God is, God is above temptation. He, he cannot be tempted. We have Jesus Christ. Jesus was taken into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted. So what does that say about Christ? That, that man is tempted, but that Christ is God. And so that's like a, another year's worth of thought and messages. Is, is who is Jesus in relation to God? The simple answer is they're one and the same. That there's, they both existed as one in eternity past. Uh, we will see one in eternity when we're in the eternity future. But for a time, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that is, that is Jesus Christ. Entirely God, entirely man, really impossible for us to understand. But he had to be tempted because he is a man. He was a man. That's another thing. Uh, 
he's, he's glorified now, so I'm say, I'll say he's not a man. He's glorified, so he's a glorified body, so he was man here on earth, so I think I have to say, again, very deep. I can change my mind trying to understand it daily because it is so deep. But Christ came, uh, God in the flesh, and he had to be tempted because if he's going to be man, man is tempted, so Christ had to be tempted. Yet when he was tempted, he did not fail like man had failed before. And because of that, he has undone the failures that we started. And that, and that happened early out in the garden. We sinned. We were, we were supposed to be, Adam was supposed to be the, the carrier of God's kingdom to the whole earth. And he failed. Israel, uh, through you know, Abraham comes, the man of faith. Israel was supposed to spread God's kingdom across the whole earth. And he failed. The only way that we could succeed is if God Himself came and said, I'll show you how to do it. So He comes and faces the temptations and where man failed time after time after time, Christ succeeded. And He has, he has become the example for us. He's become the conqueror for us. And, and just, just having undone the things that we had done wrong was not enough. Just getting the truck off the edge of the precipice was good, but it didn't accomplish what needed to be done, and that, and that was to get the truck up to the house so it could be unloaded. So we, he had undone the things that we had done wrong. But he's getting ready to go on one farther, and that is to be the perfect, which he had to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So the Another reason why he had to go through these temptations and come through sinless is because he's going to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And if, we, if you're here today and you don't know that he is your sacrifice, this is a good day to get that taken care of and know that you are redeemed by Jesus' blood. But maybe more of you fall in this category. Maybe you are saved. And maybe you have fallen to the temptations that come our way. We, we fall to the lust of the flesh. We don't trust God's providential care in the events that happen in our lives. We look around us and we see that we may not have what other people have. Or we may not have all that we think we should have. And we're not trusting God to get us from here to heaven. Or maybe we are insecure in our relationship with Him. We think we have to do things. We have to continue working to try to, to merit His favor when it's not about works. It's about the grace of God and the application of Christ's blood on your life. You don't, you don't have to do things to warrant His favor. You have warranted His favor by, being, by Him giving His Son to die for you. Now live in the joy and the favor that God's given you. So we're in at least a couple of camps where we may not know what Christ has done for us and we need to be saved or we know that Christ has died for us we need to live out, we need to uh, understand the position that He's given us and that he, he has given us a choice back. That when He said, Be gone, Satan, when He showed His godness and He says, You should worship the Lord, your God and Him only should you serve. We have that choice now. Before, when we were under Satan, we did what Satan told us to do. We were, we were His minions. But now God has freed us from that and given us the choice where we might be able to say, Lord, because you've told me to do this, I will do this. So, uh, uh, musicians come up. If you would, let's stand. And if, if God has spoken with you and said, you know what? You're not living just quite the way I'd like for you to live. You're mine. You're saved. But you're just not doing what I want you to be doing. This is a good time to come and talk to you and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And if you realize that you're not saved, God, the Spirit has spoken to your heart and said, you may not even know what He's saying, but just know it doesn't feel right. This is a good time for you to get that straightened out in your heart.